you know, Charles Wesley, I really believe was one of the greatest poets of all time. Fabulous. He's certainly up there with Tennyson and Byron and Shakespeare. Beautiful, beautiful poetry that this man wrote. And uh, I'm sorry, that wasn't a familiar song. Um, uh, perhaps it is to some of you, but I hope that it will become one uh, because I, I know it's just a glorious song. And you look at those words, how, how incredibly profound they are. And um, yes, singing them for me makes all the difference. It's, uh, it's just a glorious thing to be able to see and hear and feel that love, that amazing love that God has for, for us, his creation, the creation that abandoned him and has chosen its own way. Oh, let's see, yes, this is, um, I want to talk with you just, to, just for a minute about a beautiful day. Um, this was almost exactly 10 years ago that this photograph was taken. And um, uh, my father was visiting and uh, he was an interesting man. He was a physician. He was also a, a historian. He had a degree in history. And um, so down in San Diego, they had an exhibition of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we said to Dad, let's go down there. Let's, let's take a look at those. It was a wonderful sunny day. And uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were absolutely fascinating. I found out something new about the Bible that day, and it was, it was very interesting. You can see my daughter was there with us. It was just a wonderful time. And none of us realized that this would be the very last picture that the three of us took together. Uh, just a very few months later, I got that, that telephone call that always comes in the middle of the night. And um, uh, with the news that he had been killed uh, in, a, in a horrific car accident. And a few days later, I found myself uh, in Australia in the uh, main morgue uh, downtown in, in the city of Melbourne, identifying my father's terribly um, damaged body. It was an awful experience. And then more recently, I went to, um, to Australia and uh, I was uh, with my stepmother. I uh, we went out to dad's grave and there it was and, and while I was while I was standing there a text came to mind it was this one <coughs> Jeremiah wrote you know, Jeremiah was a man who understood the meaning of sorrow he wrote a whole book about sorrow and then he wrote another book about sorrow and mourning uh, the, Bible, the Bible doesn't pretend that terrible things do not happen. And um, Jeremiah wrote these words. Now, he was writing about quite different events, obviously, but expressing the same emotion. Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. You know, terrible things happen in this world. And I think that we're, we're all acutely aware of them. All of you have had these experiences. Nobody is immune for, from them. All of you have buried friends and, and loved ones 
immediate relatives. It's an awful thing, a terrible, terrible thing. I want you to think about this expression here, fountain of tears, because this kind of expression is actually used quite frequently in the Bible. A fountain of waters, a fountain of tears. It's very interesting to me how, you know, as we read through the Bible, which is something that I hope that you do actually do, um, because, you know, the Bible is full of stuff that isn't there if you listen to what people say about it. Um, it's uh, quite remarkable, the things that uh, people will say about God's Word. It's invaluable to read the Bible from beginning to end. And I encourage any of you who have not done that to do it. Um, I'm just doing it again this, this year. I've done it uh, plenty uh, of times before, not enough. And um, I believe that if you just read three chapters in the Old Testament and one chapter in the New Testament every day, you will be through uh, w well within a year. So if you have one of those occasions where you're dead for a day or something and you don't read your Bible at all, um, you don't have to worry, you'll still make it within a year. It's not that big of a book, um, but it is full of profound truths. So if we go towards the end of the Bible, all the way down to the book of Revelation, there is something interesting that shows up there. Um, in the book of Revelation, it tells us, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne, who is this lamb in the midst of the throne? Jesus, right. Will shepherd them. Jesus is the good shepherd. And who, is, who are the them that's being talked about here? That's us, yes. These are the saved. These are the people who Jesus died on the cross for. We'll shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, not fountains of tears. In fact, God turns this whole misery that Jeremiah was talking about, he turns it around completely. Living fountains of waters, that's what God is leading us to. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Whoa, this is, this is wonderful stuff, isn't it? It's terrifically good news, especially for somebody like me. I still mourn my father and others. Two of my cousins, I can't believe it. They're gone and I mourn them. But Jesus here is promising us living fountains of waters. He is going to wipe away all of those tears. You know, as a scientist, I'm very interested in water. You may have noticed that every now and again, it's approximately, I, uh, my, my, my rule of thumb is about every six months, if you read the newspaper or look at, you know, CNN.com or something, you'll see an excited, almost breathless announcement that they found water somewhere. And therefore, there may be life. And the reason for that is actually pretty, pretty clear. Um, this is a picture of uh, Southern California. This is where I live. And you can see that there are certain areas that are green and certain areas that are not green. Yeah. What, is, what can you find 100% of the time in the green areas? Water. water, right. Water on Earth means life. Now, interestingly enough, it hasn't proven to mean life anywhere else in the universe so far. But here on Earth, water means life. What, uh, so what it looks like is life needs water, but just because you have water certainly doesn't mean that you have life. And that's a logical error that is commonly made by, uh, well, particularly science journalists. Um, that's just stretching them apparently a little bit too hard. So let's just take a look at this, this water. Uh, this is a water molecule. You've probably seen it before. It's kind of a, a boomerang-shaped uh, molecule. I like to think it's boomerang-shaped because I'm, a, I'm Australian. And if you look 
at the way the electrons behave on the surface of this molecule, it's really interesting. The electrons like to spend time with oxygen. Oxygen is just a greedy atom when it comes to, to um, electrons and hydrogens, they're very giving kind of atoms and they will share their electrons which have a negative charge with the oxygen. So the oxygen, it gets a little bit of an a negative charge from the electrons and the hydrogens become a little bit positive. And you've probably heard that opposites attract. So negative charges are attracted to positive charges. And that's in fact what happens in water. Water is held together by these opposite charges. It's a fascinating thing because when you think about it, water is a really small, really light molecule. It's much smaller and lighter than, for example, the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out right now. It's smaller and lighter than the oxygen that you're breathing in and the nitrogen that makes up almost 80% of our atmosphere. Why is it that those things are gases and water is a liquid at room temperature? It's because of these charges hanging on to each other. And because of these, because of this special charge distribution and this special geometry, water does amazing things. If you get a lot of water together and you start doing things like heating it up, you quickly find that it changes temperature very slowly. You have to put an awful lot of energy into water. You, know, you all know that what it's like watching a pot and waiting for it to boil. It takes a long time because these charges are holding together those molecules and you have to put in a lot of energy before they start breaking loose and going off in the form of steam. There are other things that these charges do. For example, if you put certain kinds of other charged atoms or molecules into water, it will dissolve them. Those negative and positive charges will interact with ions, things like salt. And it turns out that it's really important for stuff to be able to move around in living things. Things like sodium and chloride ions, things like potassium and all of these other salts that we need to move around in our bodies and things like sugar and other molecules. They need to be able to move around. So it turns out that it's a good thing that we're made mostly of water, mostly water. Um, if you want to lose weight, the quickest way to do it is to lose water. If you want to kill yourself, the quickest way to do it is to lose water too. So you don't want to do that. It's not a good strategy for losing weight. We need that water. That water is doing all kinds of vital things for us, but it's not just that stuff dissolves in water. Because of the properties of water, we have special molecules that will interact with water in very specific ways, like these phospholipids that make up the membranes that surround our cells. If they're not in an aqueous environment, they don't work. They don't arrange themselves in that way. And in those membranes, we have things like these protein machines. This particular one's one of my favorites. It's called ATPase. In fact, this specific example that I'm giving you here is a kind of ATPase that is found in E. coli bacteria. And it's a masterpiece. It's absolutely incredible. Oh, I could, I'm trying to stop myself right now because I could spend the whole rest of today talking just about this fabulous, fabulous molecular machine. There are trillions of these inside your body, trillions of them. In fact, billions of them go down the toilet every time you use it. And it seems like a tragedy to me because, wow, these things, they're amazing. 
They are absolute masterpieces, but without water, they don't work. What they're doing right now is they are taking your breakfast and turning it into energy so that you're awake and listening to me and worshiping God in church. So they're really important, really amazing things. And of course, if water didn't have all of these properties, we couldn't have tissues made up from the cells that rely on water, tissues that are arranged into organs like your heart. And of course, if your heart didn't have an aqueous solution we call blood to pump around, if it wasn't a liquid at room temperature, if it didn't have all of those properties that are so incredibly valuable, then of course you couldn't exist at all. Water is like a miracle molecule. It's not like a miracle molecule. It is a miracle molecule. Life, certainly life as we know it, cannot exist without water. It's, it's an amazing thing. So, this is a picture of where Jesus lived. It pretty much encompasses all of the countries where we know Jesus lived. Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. Jesus was a little bit like me. He lived in different places over the course of his life. But you'll notice that here, in this picture, you can see this phenomenon of water being necessary for life. I love the way the Nile River snakes its way north. And right along where there's water, you see green. That's where the life is. In a dry land, water means life. And Jesus lived in a dry land. One day he was walking along and he was thirsty and he came to a well that had been dug by one of his ancestors, Jacob's well. And um, while he was there, he had a very interesting conversation with absolutely the wrong person. The kind of person that your mother told you you shouldn't hang out with. You shouldn't associate with people like that. And um, this lady was also looking for water because water is necessary for life. And this is, this is the conversation that Jesus had with her. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, not a fountain of tears, a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. There's this expression again, this idea of fountains, springs of water being associated with, with Jesus, with God, with our creator. Now, why is it? Have you ever wondered, why did this woman respond in the way that she did? I mean, if somebody came to me and started talking like this, frankly, I probably would think that they were mad. But she responded in a fascinating way. In fact, you could argue that she was the first person that Jesus Christ ordained to spread the gospel. Because certainly to the Gentiles, or at least to the, to the Samaritans, to, 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 the, to the evil people, the bad people, <laughs> the people who actually need to be saved. Because he allowed her to go back into her city. She immediately recognized something from these words. Why did she do it? What was it about these words that sparked something that caused her to go back into her town and say, listen, I found the Messiah. 
You'd better come out and hear him. I think it's pretty obvious, actually. If you, as this woman must have been, are a student of God's word. Because Jesus Christ is not just making up stuff here. He is quoting from the Old Testament. In fact, you can go back to the book of Jeremiah. And you'll recall that these events that were going on during the time of Jeremiah were those that led ultimately to the creation of the Samaritans, which is kind of interesting. But um, yeah, here is something else that Jeremiah said. He said, O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me, now he's quoting God here, those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. How interesting. You know, there are those people who say the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. But these are people who clearly haven't read the Old or the New Testament. Because it's very, very clear that this is the same God. And Jesus Christ is describing himself as the same God here. He has just had a conversation with a woman who apparently was on the fringes of society. She was the wrong race. She was the wrong gender. And she had far too many husbands. Everything was wrong about this woman. Except for one thing. Just one but it was really important. Somehow or other, she knew something about what the Bible said. And despite everything, she acted on what she knew. She wanted to have something to do with this fountain of living waters. She knew that Jesus was not just sort of um, speaking nonsense, she understood the metaphor completely. She understood what Paul ultimately understood as well. I love the way that he put it here in 1 Corinthians 15. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, um, did you ever wonder where that's written? I certainly did. That's why I looked it up. Yeah, death is swallowed up in victory. Where did that come from? It turns out that he's quoting the Old Testament. This time he's quoting, uh, this time the quotation comes from Isaiah, which is a book that we know that Jesus was quite familiar with. It got him into trouble reading it in the synagogue. They wanted to kill him. He will swallow up death forever. There's, um, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Well, look at that. Where did we read that just a little while ago? That's in, in the book of Revelation, right? Yeah. Book of Revelation, I don't know. You know I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a biblical scholar or something, but I would like to know what percentage of the book of Revelation is basically directly quoting the Old Testament, and particularly Isaiah. Because there's certainly all kinds of connections in there. We as Adventists, we like to talk about Daniel and Revelation. But what about Isaiah and Revelation. It's full of it. Full of it. Yeah. Death is going to be swallowed up in victory and God is going to wipe away the tears from our eyes. Our eyes will no longer be a fountain of tears. Because Jesus Christ is the fountain of living waters. Death will be swallowed up forever 
Yes, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. In fact, it's of such great importance that in the book of Revelation, this point is hammered away. And that is where we get to the text for today, the Bible reading for today. One that, to be perfectly honest, I have struggled with for most of my life. Okay? And, um, yeah, I, I uh, actually ran into Lant Colburn this morning. That was an exciting thing. He also went to Far Eastern Academy with me in Singapore, which was a wonderful experience. But there were certain things, you know how it is when you're a, when you're a child, life can be a little bit confusing. And um, I got progressively more confused about the gospel because um, there are a few things that came together. Number one, people kept talking about the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And um, when I'd ask, well, what is the gospel? What, what exactly is that? You know, I'm, I'm not overly bright. And so I, I, you know, couldn't necessarily figure it out for myself. And uh, so I kept asking, well, what, what is the gospel? Just tell me what it is, you know. And I'd be told things like, well, it's the good news. Um, okay, um, that's nice, but what, what's the good news? It's the gospel. Um, you know, or the good news is Jesus Christ died on the cross. Well, how on earth is that good news? It's pretty bad news. And I, I, I was kind of excited because, you know, we would get regularly preachers coming through and they would love to preach about the three angels message or messages and they're right at the beginning you know the first angels message um here here at last we have precisely what the gospel is then i saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel this is the big one this is the everlasting one okay so now, now, and, and look, he's going to say it, uh, it, it. Well, it's to preach to all those who dwell on the earth. Well, my parents were missionaries. That's what we were doing, right? We were out there. We're preaching it to all the world, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And uh, he's saying it with a loud voice. So this is really important. Everybody should be able to hear it. And what is his message? It is fear God and give glory to him for his hour of judgment has come. And... Um, you know, here is where things get kind of um, a bit weird. Because I can assure you that preacher after preacher after preacher and multiple teachers got this far in the everlasting gospel. This is precisely how far they got, at which point there was an extended soliloquy about the hour of God's judgment, how there were lakes of fire prepared for the wicked, and that is where those who are not good enough were going to end their existence, and the smoke of their torment was going to rise forever and ever. And how awful it would be to miss out on heaven and wind up in one of those lakes of burning fire. Judgment sounded pretty bad. It really sounded awful. And in addition to that, just to, just to make sure that we were sort of devoid of all hope, we were provided with things that we weren't doing well enough. And after a while, you know, you sort of start believing it. And... I have watched the, um, uh, the, the uh, outcome of those who embraced this particular gospel. As far as I can tell, not one of my friends is a Christian anymore who embraced this gospel. Of course they're not. There was no hope. We could never reach this spectacular standard. In fact, um, Okay, and this is, I'm going to say something that will, might get me run out of this church and tossed off a cliff like Jesus. Um, or at least they tried to do it. You know, I can assure you that if this is a normal Christian church, you have had 
struggles with this here. You've had people coming in, making up all kinds of stuff about if your diet isn't perfect and if such and such isn't perfect and if you don't eat at exactly the right time of day, the precisely right foods and all the rest of it, then Jesus won't come. And all kinds of other absolute bunk and nonsense. Jesus chose the woman at the well, the sinner, because she understood enough about his word that she was capable of recognizing the Lord God Almighty in human form. That's the important thing. It isn't what you're going to do with your vegan potluck. In addition to that, when it comes to the Bible, it's absolutely important to actually read it and not part of it, and then use that as an opportunity to undermine the joy that is inherent in the gospel which pervades all of Scripture, the actual good news that is there. So let's read on here. Okay, for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. Now, incredibly, and this is really kind of a dicey area that I'm walking into. So, you know, if you're easily offended, um, Please, block your ears now. But, yeah, I actually um, have friends, and I want to be really clear. It's not that I think I know more than everybody else. But there is a school of thought that says, Aha! Springs of water. When God destroyed the world in the flood, it was fountains of the deep. That's close enough for me. This is a threat. This is talking about God's judgment. The springs of water, they're God's judgment. He's going to destroy the world again, but this time he's going to do it with lakes of fire, not lakes of water. It's not just Adventists who are saying this stuff, okay? It's not just actually friends, professors in our seminaries, okay? Um, I'm sorry, I just disagree. I disagree because when you read the Bible, this is clearly not what's being said here. Are these springs of waters, by the way, something to do with God's judgment? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. But you know what God's judgment is? You see, God is the creator of all things. God when he created, created something that was very good in his own judgment. It was very good. Springs of water. What's being talked about here? God is the source of life. Every time this is mentioned in the Bible, as far as I can tell. It's talking about God as the life giver. And in the book of Revelation, this is absolutely clear. When it's talking about springs of water, it's talking about God's judgment, all right? God's judgment is, I'm bringing life. That's God's judgment. God's judgment is righteous judgment. God's judgment is not, wow, good. Here's my opportunity. I'm going to toss them all into a lake of fire. Let's see who squeals the longest. That's not righteous judgment. Now, are things going to work out well for those who reject the source of life? Of course not. Of course not. But it's not God's will that any should perish. That's not God's will. The point is, 
God's will is not being done here on earth. That's why we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because that's what we want. We want God's judgment. We want God's righteous judgment. God's righteous judgment is to do a new creation. And that is what the book of Revelation is talking about. He will wipe away, wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That's God's judgment. Fabulously good news. That's what the world needs to hear. That's the everlasting gospel. That's the news that this church, that each one of us individually who is here in Cleburne, Texas, on this Sabbath, that's our job to preach that here. Not somewhere else. Not by giving more offerings to preach the gospel somewhere in Russia or India or the Philippines or something. Here. This is the message that we have for our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones. It is absolutely glorious and wonderful. It's fabulously good news. He who was seated on the throne. Who is it who's seated on the throne? Jesus Christ himself. The same Jesus Christ who met with the woman at the well. Who talked about a living fountain of waters. This is what he says to you and me. I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The same God who created is the God who is doing the new creation. The same God who promised eternal life to the woman at the well promises it to you. The same God who spoke through his prophets in the Old Testament, promising fountains of living waters, is the same God whom we worship here today. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. Fabulous. And he's making everything new. My father had a twin brother. And uh, this is the last picture that I believe uh, I took with him. That's me, my wife, and my aunt and uncle. And just a month or so ago, we buried him. That was awful too. You know, one of the things that I convinced him to do was one of these genetic um, tests, because I was interested. And it was lovely that he showed up as my father. Yeah. But he's gone now too. And of course, I mourn him. But you know, I also rejoice because there is a gospel out there and it is true. And it is written down. It is as certain as anything imaginable. That same God who talked with the woman at the well also says to you and me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Amen. These fountains of water are important. My prayer today is that each one of us will hear God's word, that we'll believe that we'll be like that woman at the well, that we'll go out to our, to our village and that we will bring our village to the feet of Jesus, the source of life, joy, and happiness. 
and hope.